Chapter 11 You idiot! I cried. You stupid idiot! Nate laughed and slid the green creature mask off his head. His dark hair was damp and matted across his forehead. Lisa, did I scare you? I pumped both fists against his green rubber chest. How could you do that to me? Did you think that was funny? Oops, sorry, he said, his smile fading. I just wasn't thinking, I'm sorry. You ruined the whole scene. I heard a voice behind me say. I turned and saw Isaac with a little camcorder in his hand. We'll have to start again. Too bad, I said. I can't believe you would do that to me, Nate, especially after, after. He tried to slide his green arm around my shoulders, but I backed away. I just got carried away, he said. Guess I like being a demon too much. We're sorry, Sarah Lynn said, her eyes on Nate. It's just that we've been working for days on my horror video. Do you like the demon costume? Nate said, thumping the green chest with one fist. It was actually used in an old Universal horror film back in the 50s. It's from my costume collection. Hey, Nate, you should do it without the mask, Isaac said. Your face is a lot scarier. Sarah Lynn put an arm around my waist. Lisa, forgive us. Sometimes Nate is an idiot. You don't understand, I said. These days, I'm scared of my own reflection. Last night, I saw a creature running through the woods. And now, now when I saw you in your costume coming at me, my voice trailed off. Sarah Lynn kept her arm around my waist. We know you've been having a tough time. I took a deep breath and forced myself to stop trembling. I'm going to stop being ridiculous, I said. I promise. I'm going to be myself again, you'll see. Maybe we should go inside, Nate said. We need to shoot the rest at night, Isaac said. It's too nice outside to be scary. I started to follow them to the house. I felt much better. They really were good friends. Other kids might have laughed or made jokes or tried to embarrass me for seeing a demon in the backyard. But they tried to assure me that I wasn't crazy. Nate stepped up beside me as we made our way along the side of the garage. I have a new horror film on DVD, he said. My big, fat, blood-soaked wedding. Have you seen it? Of course not, I said. I heard it's a riot, Isaac said. Let's watch it. Sarah Lynn said. Nate, what have you got for snacks? I stopped at the kitchen door. Through the window, I could see Nate's mom taking something out of the oven. The smell of chocolate floated over the backyard. I, I can't stay, I said. Sorry, Nate said, squeezing my hand. A horror film is probably a bad idea. I didn't think. It's not that, I said. I have a doctor's appointment. I just came over to apologize. You know, for yesterday when you came over, I was a beast. I'm really sorry, I... Has the doctor been helpful? Sarah Lynn asked. She's wonderful, I said. She's so supportive. She makes me feel I really can get over this. That's so nice you have someone good to talk to, Sarah Lynn said. Behind her... Isaac was waving frantically, trying to get my attention. I turned to him. What's up? Hey, I have a great idea, he said. Why don't you come hear my band at the hothouse Friday night? We totally suck, but maybe it will take your mind off everything. Yeah, maybe, I said. But I realized I didn't want to do that. Since the accident... I'd only seen my three friends. I hadn't seen anyone else from school. And if I went to hear Isaac's band, all these people would be feeling sorry for me and staring at me and giving me sympathetic looks and offering me condolences and saying how sorry they were. I knew they'd all mean well, but I couldn't take it. 
I knew all that attention and all that sympathy would freak me out. So you'll come? Isaac said. Well, I'll ask Dr. Shine if it's a good idea, I said. Nate tugged at the neck of his green rubber costume. I've got to get out of this thing, he groaned. It's 200 degrees in here. I gazed at the demon mask crumpled in his hand. You make a terrifying monster, I said. For some reason, Nate blushed. Then he grinned at me. Seriously, that's my real personality. His cheeks remained red. I saw Sarah Lynn flash him a disapproving look, like he shouldn't have made that joke. What's going on with these two? I wondered. Is there something I'm not getting? Are they more than friends? Chapter 12 Dr. Shine has one weird habit that I've noticed. She has a white mug filled with yellow pencils on her desk beside the phone. And as we talk, she chews on an eraser. By the time our session is over, she has completely chewed the eraser off. I've never seen her spit one out. I think she swallows them. Weird, right? Just a nervous habit, I guess. Aside from the eraser chewing, she is totally normal and nice, and just an awesome, sweet, understanding person. I couldn't have survived all that has happened to me without her, and that's the truth. Now, I sat in the red leather armchair across from her wide glass desk. My hands were sweaty and left a trail of dampness on the chair arms. I kept crossing and uncrossing my legs. Yes, Dr. Shine was always understanding and never judgmental. But it made me tense whenever I told her about the crazy things I had imagined or done. I was eager for her to think that I was getting better, even if I didn't believe it myself. The sun had come out early in the afternoon and filled the windows behind her with yellow light. Her short blonde hair appeared to glow. She has bright blue eyes behind her frameless glasses and a friendly expression, even though she seldom smiles. She leaned forward as we talked, her eyes on me, her hands clasped over the glass desktop. Her desk was empty except for a red phone, a small silver clock, a framed photo of a yellow lab, and the notepad on which she scribbled notes. Go on, Lisa. Tell me what happened the other night, she said. She has a soft voice, just above a whisper. Sometimes, I have to lean forward in the chair to hear her. You seem reluctant to talk today. Is anything special troubling you? Not really, I said. I gazed at the large painting of a beach and ocean waves on the wall at her side. I mean, nothing special, just... She rolled the pencil in her fingers. Just what? Well, I think I went sleepwalking, I started. I was dreaming, I guess. A sound woke me up. Animal cries and I woke up in the woods. I swallowed. You sleepwalked into the woods? She asked. My mother found me and shook me awake, I answered. But before she did, I saw something frightening. A creature. Half human, half... Creature. Very weird and ugly. How clearly did you see it? She asked softly. Did you run? Did it follow you? Mm, no. It disappeared into the trees. My voice broke. Am I going totally crazy? How can I be seeing these things? I, I never sleepwalked before. I mean, does this mean I'm getting worse? She set down the pencil and motioned to the bottle of water in my lap. Take some water, Lisa. You're upsetting yourself. We've talked about this process before. I know, but... She swept back her hair with one hand. 
you're not getting worse. As we've said, getting better is a process. But the first thing you always need to remember is that you are going to get better. You are going to get okay again. And all of these symptoms will disappear. I could hear her speaking, but I couldn't concentrate on what she was saying. I was picturing the shadowy creature in the woods. My whole body shuddered, suddenly feeling the damp cold of the woods all over again. I understand about imagining that I see Morty, I said, and about thinking I see my dad. We've already talked about my guilty feelings and how they keep appearing. But, Dr. Shine, why did I see some kind of demon? Maybe your demons have to come out, she replied. She tapped both hands on the glass desktop. Lisa, your symptoms are not unusual for someone who has had the kind of traumatic accident you have. But how do we make them stop? My voice came out high and shrill. The water bottle rolled out of my lap, and I bent over to retrieve it on the dark carpet. By talking, she said. You and I will keep talking, and you will see improvements every week, I promise. I like talking to you, I blurted out. I mean, you've made me feel better already. That made her smile. She scribbled some words rapidly on the yellow notepad in front of her. I have a couple of suggestions to help things along, she said. She twisted the slender gold watch on her wrist. First of all, go back to school on Monday. Really? I cried. I felt a burst of happiness. She nodded. It will be good for you to be back with your friends in a normal setting, and schoolwork will help take your mind off your troubled feelings. Oh, thank you, I said. I've been wanting to go back, but my mom... I also think you need something else to occupy your mind, she continued. I squinted at her. I don't understand. Do you mean like a hobby? Or an after-school job, maybe? She tapped the pencil eraser against her lips. Do you think you're ready for an after-school job? I shrugged. I think so. And we could use the money since Mom can't go back to work. What kind of job, Lisa? Did you do any kind of work back in Shaker Heights? Well, I thought hard. Not really. I didn't have a job. But I did a lot of babysitting. Behind her eyeglasses... Her eyes grew wide. Babysitting? Really? Yes, I said. I'm good with kids, and I like taking care of them. I took care of my cousin Stephen, until his family moved to Santa Barbara. Dr. Shine nodded. That might not be a bad idea. Perhaps caring for someone else will help you pull your mind from your own problems. She pulled open a file drawer under her desk. You know what? Now that you mention it, I might have something for you. I leaned forward in my chair. A babysitting job? She sifted through some folders and pulled out a sheet of paper. Yes, here it is. I'd almost forgotten. I know someone who was looking for a babysitter for her little boy. She worked at the hospital where I trained. Wow, that's wonderful, I said. Her eyes scanned the page, then returned to me. Her name is Brenda Hart. Her little boy is eight, I think. Awesome, I said. This is so totally nice of you. She copied down the information on her yellow pad, tore off the sheet, and handed it to me. Thank you, Dr. Shine, I said. I glanced at the name and address. My eyes stayed on the address. They live on Fear Street? Yes, they do, she replied. You don't have a problem with Fear Street, do you, Lisa? I hesitated. Well, 
Surely you don't believe all the foolish, scary stories about that street. The ancient curses everyone talks about. You don't believe in such a thing as an evil street, do you? I blinked. No, of course not. Part 3 Chapter 13 You're new in town, Isaac said. You don't understand about Fear Street. Please don't try to discourage me, I told him. I really need this job. Mom can't go back to the salon because of her broken arm. And I'm really good at babysitting. He put a hand on my arm. Lisa, you should think about this. Seriously. It was after school on Monday. My first day back was a non-event. I expected kids to make a big fuss and tell me how sorry they were about my dad and about the accident. But no one said much of anything. In fact, most people in my classes acted as if I'd never been away. That was a total relief, believe me. Sarah Lynn was really nice. She helped me bring my science notebook up to date in study hall. And she gave me some other worksheets and test prep papers I was missing. Nate was very kind, too. I told him I wanted to walk to Isaac's house after school and watch his band rehearse. He said he'd pick me up there and drive me to my job interview on Fear Street. It was a warm spring day. Red and yellow tulips bobbed in the flower beds in front of Isaac's house. Leaves on the trees had started to open, revealing the bright, fresh green color you only see in early spring. Isaac's band practiced in the garage behind his house. I could hear them as I walked up his gravel driveway, and I could tell they were terrible from halfway up the drive. Isaac has three little sisters, and I could see them watching me from an open window at the side of the house. All three of them had their hands over their ears. The garage door was open. I saw Isaac, knees bent, swaying from side to side as he played lead guitar. He nodded as I approached. Two other guys were behind him, deeper in the garage. I saw Booker Todd, a guy I knew from school, playing a left-handed bass guitar, and a short, skinny kid I didn't recognize, who looked about twelve, banging away on part of a drum set. I honestly couldn't tell if they were playing the same song or three different songs. Maybe it was supposed to be like jazz, where the musicians all go off in different directions. I stood in the driveway watching them, keeping a forced smile on my face so they'd think I was enjoying it. Inside the house, I could hear the three sisters arguing loudly about something. Finally, Isaac ended the number. He slid the guitar over his head and set it down on the garage floor. Hey, Lisa! He walked over to me, scratching his curly black hair. He had a big sweat stain on the front of his Vampire Weekend t-shirt. Behind him in the garage, the two other guys had water bottles tilted to their mouths. I know we suck, Isaac said in a hushed voice, glancing back at the two players. You don't have to pretend. You only have three guys in your band? I asked. He wiped sweat off his forehead with a t-shirt sleeve. No, Derek Palmer plays saxophone but his parents grounded him for a week because he got wasted at Carrie Reacher's party last Friday and threw up on the living room couch after he got home. Not cool, I said. Not cool. And that kid? Isaac pointed. He's not the real drummer. He lives across the street. He's totally clueless. <sighs> Jamie Weiner says he's quitting because we're hopeless. Bad attitude, I said. He smiled. Hey, not a bad name for a band. I heard a car rumble by and thought it was Nate. Nate's picking me up for my job interview, I said, glancing to the street. Yeah, I know. On Fear Street? Isaac said. You'll see. It looks like a normal street. Normal houses, normal people. But it's not normal. Not at all. Please, I started, raising a hand to silence him. Listen to me, Lisa. There's a real curse on the street. It's not a joke. It's not made up. They teach us about Fear Street and the Fear family in school. Seriously. 
I shook my head. Every town has its legends, I said. Every town has its spooky stories. Even Shaker Heights had houses people said were haunted, and there were two families who hated each other, Isaac continued. The goods and the fears. They put curses on each other. They practiced dark magic and sorcery. They teach us all this in history class in sixth grade. He placed his hands on my shoulders. I can see you don't believe me. But there have been horrible murders on Fear Street, Lisa. People with their heads missing and their blood drained and- Stop! I cried. I really don't believe this horror movie stuff, Isaac. Stop trying to scare me. He held on to my shoulders. To my surprise, his expression changed. His eyes went wide. He pulled me close, lowered his face to mine, and kissed me. It was a fierce, needy kiss. His lips felt dry and rough. I was so startled I didn't pull back. I just stood there and let him kiss me. His hold on my shoulders kept me in place. I couldn't breathe. I was just so surprised. But then I turned my face away and stumbled out of his grasp. No, Isaac. I managed to choke out. Please, you know that Nate and I... I gasped as I realized I was staring at Nate. He stood a few feet down the driveway. Did he see us kiss? The red afternoon sun beamed down on him, like catching him in a spotlight of fire. He had the strangest expression on his face. His eyes locked coldly on Isaac. Chapter 14 How's band practice? Nate finally said to Isaac. Isaac's face was bright red. He shrugged. You know. I could still feel Isaac's rough lips on mine. Nate turned to me. We'd better get going. He turned and strode down the driveway, kicking up gravel as he walked. Catch you later, Isaac said. I've got to whip these guys into shape. He flashed me a strange smile. Good luck on Fear Street, Lisa. I gave him a quick wave, then turned to follow Nate. My mind was spinning. Isaac and Nate had been good friends for a long time. Isaac knew he shouldn't have kissed me. It wasn't like a friendly kiss either. It was too intense for that. I knew Nate had seen us. What was he going to say about it? Actually, Nate didn't say much as we made our way to Fear Street. He kept his eyes straight ahead on the road, as if he didn't want to see me sitting beside him. I wasn't like him at all to be so silent. He was making me more and more uncomfortable. Isaac was telling me about Fear Street, I said finally to break the silence. Actually, he was warning me. I don't believe that stuff, Nate said, swerving to pass a school bus. Everyone is so freaked out by the Fear family. He shook his head. I'm not friends with Brendan Fear, but I think he's a good dude. Brendan Fear was a senior at Shadyside High. I'd seen him in the halls, but I hadn't met him. Isaac said I shouldn't take the job because it's on Fear Street, I said. Nate stared straight ahead. Isaac reads too many comic books, he said. That ended the conversation. The sun went behind clouds as we turned onto Fear Street, and the sky darkened. Tall trees slanted over the street. The houses looked old. They had wide front yards and were set far back from the street. A rabbit darted across the street in front of us, and Nate swung the wheel to miss it. Whoa! I cried out as I was swung against the passenger door. My first dangerous moment on Fear Street, I joked. But Nate didn't laugh. We passed a wooded lot. A tall, dark-shingled house came into view, 
set behind a low hedge. What number is that? I asked. I think that's the house. Nate hit the brake, and we crept past the driveway. The number on the mailbox was 32. Yes, that's it. I gazed up at it through the windshield. The house was completely dark except for an orangey light in the front window. As we pulled up the drive, the front porch light flashed on. Mrs. Hart must have been watching for me, I said. I straightened my hair. Do I look okay? Nate finally turned to me. Yeah, you look fine. My chest suddenly felt fluttery. My hands were cold. I can't believe I'm so nervous, I said. Guess I really want the job. Piece of cake, Nate said. He leaned over and kissed my cheek. Go get him. My face tingled. I didn't expect him to kiss me. I've got to pick up my brother at his piano lesson, he said. I'll drop him back home, then I'll swing back and get you. I started to open the door. Good luck, he called after me. I took a deep breath and strode toward the brightly lit front porch. Chapter 15 Brenda Hart pulled open the door before I rang the bell. Lisa, come in. She pushed open the storm door and ushered me into the front hall. The house was warm and smelled of roast chicken. The walls were dark green. A tall brass lamp stood over a table with a stack of unopened mail on its top. She shook hands with me. Nice to meet you. I'm Brenda Hart. The front entryway opened into the living room. A steep wooden stairway led to the second floor. The living room had the same dark green walls. Two ceiling lights sent down a wash of pale light over the dark furniture. Two armchairs behind a low coffee table, facing a steep-backed black leather couch. An open copy of People magazine lay on the couch. Brenda motioned for me to take one of the chairs. She was a thin, pretty woman, probably in her late thirties. She had black hair pushed straight back and tied in a loose ponytail behind her head. Her eyes were dark, and the lines beneath them made her look tired. She was dressed young. She had a short pleated skirt over black tights and a long-sleeved cream-colored t-shirt. She sighed as she took the armchair next to me. It's been a long day. I'm glad you came. Thank you. I said, clearing my throat. She seemed like a nice person. Why couldn't I get over my nervousness? Do you live nearby? She asked. I nodded. My mom and I, we live on Village Road near the pond. We just moved to Shadyside, a few months ago. Her dark eyes locked on mine. Do you like it? Yes, I said. It's a little different from Shaker Heights. I mean... Smaller, but I like the school, and I've made some friends. She pulled a pack of sugarless gum from her t-shirt pocket and offered me a piece. I waved it away. She slid two pieces into her mouth. I'm addicted to this stuff. I'm a Mentos freak, I confessed. She let out a dry, almost silent laugh. Her dark eyes flashed. Let me tell you about the job she said, leaning closer to me. It's babysitting, right? I said. I suddenly realized I didn't see or hear a kid. The house was silent, except for the soft tick of a large square clock on the mantelpiece. And I didn't see any toys or other evidence of a child in the house. It's a little more than babysitting, Brenda said. She settled back on the chair. I'd better start at the beginning. I just got a new job, and the hours are kind of long. You mean you work late? I asked. She brushed back her ponytail. Yes, three days a week. I don't get home till nine or ten. So, this is what I need, Lisa. I need someone to pick Harry up at four o'clock, three days a week. 
How old is Harry? I asked. Harry is eight, going on 35, she joked. She gave that dry, whispery laugh again. Actually, he's a sweetheart. You'll love him. She drummed the arm of the chair. I noticed her long, perfect fingernails, a dark red. Harry has to be picked up at my sister's house, Brenda continued. She waved a hand. It's a few blocks away. My sister Alice is homeschooling Harry, and she's just a terrific teacher. Nice, I said awkwardly. She was waiting for me to respond, and I didn't know what to say. I heard a creaking sound and turned toward the door. Brenda sighed. That's just the old stairway, she said. It likes to creak and groan like an old man. You'll get used to it. I don't even hear it anymore. I had some carpenters out to look at it, but they said all old houses shift and groan. I gazed at the stairway for a moment. The banister was smoothly polished dark wood. The steps had no carpet on them. So you pick up Harry at four, Brenda said. You bring him home. You help him with his homework. Sometimes Alice piles it on, even though he's only eight. Harry is a good student, I asked. He likes to work, she answered. He's very curious about all kinds of things. She chewed the gum for a while, studying me. After homework, you give him dinner, then entertain him for a while. He has an Xbox game he loves. He plays it for hours. That sounds like fun, I said. You put him to bed around eight and wait till I get home at nine or ten. She leaned close again and put a hand on my wrist. Is that too many hours for you, Lisa? No, I said. I don't think so. I can do my homework after Harry goes to bed. She nodded. If you can take the job, I'll pay you well. I'll be honest, I'm really desperate to find someone good. I'll pay you $300 a week. Whoa. I thought maybe I hadn't heard correctly. Three hundred a week? I repeated. She nodded. This will really help our money problems, I thought. We'll be fine till mom can go back to work. Finally, I've had some good luck. Does this sound like something you'd like to do? She asked. She tugged at a loose strand of her dark hair. Definitely, I said. I wanted to jump up and down for joy. I couldn't wait to tell my mother the good news. Definitely. Harry is quiet and very self-sufficient, Brenda said. He'll let you do your homework. What year are you, Lisa? Junior, I said. Have you started to look at colleges? I hesitated. Well, my mom and I have had some bad luck, I think I'm going to have to work for at least a year before I can go away to school. She nodded, her dark eyes locked on mine, studying me. Well, I hope this job helps, she said. You'll like Harry. He's a little moody at times, but he'll be very little trouble. I gazed around the living room again. I still didn't see a single clue that an eight-year-old boy lived here. Can I meet Harry? I said. Is he home? He's the kind of kid who needs his rest, she said. I try to put him to bed early. She climbed to her feet. She adjusted the short skirt over her tights. Come up to his room with me. I'll introduce you. I followed her to the stairway. The old wooden steps creaked and groaned under our shoes as we climbed to the second floor. Harry's room was at the end of a long, dimly lit hall. The carpet was thin and torn in places. I heard the soft drip, drip of water from a small bathroom as we passed it. Harry's door was closed. We stopped at the door and Brenda knocked softly. No answer. She pushed the door open slowly. To my surprise... 
room was totally dark. No light of any kind. Harry, are you in here? Brenda called softly. Harry, are you here? Chapter 16 Silence Then a lamp flickered on, and I could see the boy sitting up in his bed, blinking in surprise. My first thought, he's adorable. He was round-cheeked and blonde, his hair tousled over his broad forehead. Squinting into the lamplight, I saw that he had big blue eyes and a sweet, angelic smile. He didn't seem surprised to see a stranger in his room. Brenda led the way to the side of the bed. Despite the warm night, Harry wore flannel pajamas with Star Wars characters all over them. Harry, this is Lisa, Brenda said. Were you asleep? Why were you sitting in the dark? I blurted out. He brushed his hair off his forehead. I like to make up movies in my mind, he said. He had a funny, scratchy voice. I like movies too, I said, eager to ingratiate myself. Do you like scary movies? He asked. Not really, I said. I get too scared. Me too, he said, pointing a finger at his chest. I don't like to be scared. Lisa is going to stay with you when I'm at work, Brenda said, straightening his striped quilt. Would you like that? Harry's eyes grew wide. Will you sing my favorite song to me? He asked me. I blinked. Your favorite song? What is it? He grinned. Eatsy weensy spider. Huh? But that's a baby song, I said. His smile faded. Not if it's about a real spider, he said in his scratchy voice. Weird. I turned to Brenda. What is he talking about? Harry likes to make jokes, don't you, Harry? Not really, he said. So, Lisa will pick you up at Alice's and take care of you when I'm at work, Brenda told him. Harry turned his blue eyes on me. Can we stay up late? Can we? Something about the desperate way he asked me made me laugh. Well... Can we? He really wanted an answer. I don't know, I said. We'll see. He tossed his fists in the air as if he'd won a victory. Yes! Time to go to sleep, Brenda said, smoothing her hand gently over his hair. No more movies in your mind, okay? Just sleep. Okay. He settled his head on the pillow. Good night, Lisa. Good night, I said. See you soon, Harry. We stepped back into the hall. Brenda closed the bedroom door behind us. So, you'll take the job? She asked softly. I nodded. Yes. I can't imagine anyone saying no to Harry. He's a total angel. I started to follow her to the stairway, but halfway down the hall, she turned and grabbed my wrist. Listen, she said in a whisper. Don't let Harry stay up late. Seriously, it's very bad for him. Don't ever let Harry stay up late. Chapter 17 Nate kissed me lightly, I pressed my lips against his, harder. I wrapped my hands behind his head and held him there and kissed him until we couldn't breathe. I pulled my face back, my hands lingering in his hair. Finish the story, he said, nuzzling my cheek with his head. We were wrapped around each other on the couch facing the fireplace in my living room. 
So the mother told you to not let the kids stay up late? Nate said. I nodded. Yes, she said, don't ever let him. And I said, why not? Does he have some kind of condition? And what did she say? Nate urged. She said, no, he doesn't have a condition. He just needs more sleep than most kids. She said he gets very grouchy, and he can't focus if he doesn't get eight hours sleep. Weird, right? Wish I could get eight hours sleep, Nate said, sighing. My brother is an early bird. He jumps on my bed to wake me up at 6.30 in the morning for no reason. You should probably kill him, I said. Nate laughed. He thinks I'm funny. He pulled me against him and we kissed some more. When the front doorbell rang, we both jumped up as if we'd been caught doing something wrong. I brushed back my hair and hurried to open the door. Sarah Lynn and Isaac walked in. Don't talk to me. I'm in a really bad mood, Isaac said. Well, hello to you too, I said. Did you come over here to put us all in a bad mood? Definitely, he said. Why should I be the only one? He won't shut up about his band, Sarah Lynn said. I've begged him to stop talking about it. Begged and pleaded, but... Somebody put me out of my misery, Isaac wailed. No, really, shoot me now. He plopped down on the couch beside Nate. Isaac, what's up? Nate said. Isaac raised his fist and punched Nate really hard in the thigh. Did that hurt? Nate uttered a cry and scooted to the other side of the couch. Yeah, that hurt. Are you crazy? That's the way my brain feels, Isaac said. Nate rubbed his leg. Since when did you get a brain? He growled. My band has a gig Saturday night, Isaac said, ignoring Nate's insult. You know, at the hothouse, an actual paying job. And guess what? We're down to two members. Me and the dopey kid from across the street who doesn't know which end of the drumsticks to hold. That's bad news, Nate said. Remind me not to go see you Saturday night. Nate kept flashing Isaac angry looks. I wondered if he was thinking about Isaac kissing me in front of his garage. I knew Nate had seen us, but he still hadn't said a word about it to me. Isaac growled again and turned away from the three of us. He buried his head in his hands and muttered curses to himself. He likes to be as overdramatic as he can. Can we talk about something else? Sarah Lynn said. How was your first day back at school, Lisa? Not bad, I said. Everyone was really nice. I was so happy to be back, I didn't even mind Mr. Trevelyan's horrible jokes. He thinks he's a riot, Sarah Lynn said. He probably gets his jokes from kindergarten books. What did the apples say to the ground? I think I'm falling for you. That doesn't even make sense, Isaac muttered. I hope Lisa didn't go back to school too soon. We all turned as my mom came walking into the room. She carried a tall blue vase of yellow tulips to the coffee table in her good arm. I don't want her to put extra pressure on herself. She needs to recover in good time. It was Dr. Shine's idea, Mom, I snapped. I'm back at school, so stop fretting about it. I found myself getting easily annoyed at my mother the past few days. She never used to be a worrier. She was always the calm, unemotional one in the family. But since the accident, she fretted about every little thing. And she was always totally negative and disturbing about anything that happened. I wanted to get better and go on with my life. I didn't want to mope around and worry that I shouldn't try things. Mom set the tulips down and fussed over them for a few seconds. Did Lisa tell you about her job? It's such good news for us, especially since I can't go back to the salon because of this. She waved her cast in the air. Lisa will be an awesome nanny, Sarah Lynn said. That kid is lucky he... But the job is on Fear Street, Mom interrupted, shaking her head. I'm just not sure about that. Stop it, Mom, I said. 
Stop trying to discourage me. It was Dr. Shine's idea, remember? She thinks I can handle it. Let me give it a try. Besides, since when are you so superstitious? Mom flinched. I could see that my question hurt her. But I didn't care. I was starting a new part of my life, and I needed encouragement, not more doubt. Everyone went home a short while later. Isaac said he was going to beg his friends to come back to the band. Nate kissed me quickly and said he'd be glad to drive me to my new job the next day after school. Sarah Lynn said to call later if I needed her. I went to my room to do some reading for English class, but before I could find the assignment, the phone rang. I didn't recognize the number on the phone, but I answered it anyway. Hello? Lisa? It's Summer Lawson. Summer Lawson. It took me a few seconds to remember her. A tall, copper-haired girl in my government class. Very pretty, with high cheekbones like a fashion model. Always wears a lot of clanky plastic bracelets and beads and long dangling earrings. Has a lot of attitude and style. Summer Lawson. My mind whirred, trying to remember more. She was Nate's girlfriend. Yes, before me. What broke them up? I didn't really know. Hey, Summer, I said. What's up? There was a long silence. Then she replied. Do you know that you're in major trouble? Her voice was cold, flat. Excuse me? I said. What? kind of trouble. Lisa, she said. Do you have any clue about Nate? Huh? I, I really don't know what you're talking about, I stammered. You'll find out, she said. A loud click ended the conversation. Chapter 18 after school the next day, I felt kind of shaky, tense about my new job. As I walked up the driveway to Brenda's sister's house, I saw Harry in the front window. The sunlight caught his blonde hair and made him glow like an angel. This is going to be fun, I told myself. Alice's house was small and square, painted white with dark green shutters at the windows. A racing bike leaned against the side wall. Spring flowers in large pots on both sides of the front stoop hadn't yet opened their buds. Across the street, a boy kept throwing a tennis ball onto the slanted roof of his house, then catching it as it rolled off. I saw a red kite caught in the high limbs of a tree at the neighbor's driveway. I stepped onto the front stoop, and the front door swung open. Alice greeted me with a smile and waved me inside. She looked like an older version of Brenda. Her cheeks and forehead were lined. Her hair was cut short, streaks of gray with the black. She wore maroon sweats and carried a Harry Potter book in one hand. Lisa, it's nice to meet you. We shook hands. Her hand was warm and soft. Brenda told me about you. I understand you've already met Harry. Harry ran up to me and tugged at my arm. Can we stay up late tonight? Can we? I laughed. Alice frowned and shook her head. How about saying hello first, Harry? Hello, Harry said. Can we stay up late? No, you cannot, Alice said firmly. Don't try to take advantage of Lisa because she's new. Remember, Lisa is the boss. Can you remember that? Maybe, Harry replied. Alice waved the book in front of her. I've started to read him his first Harry Potter book. You're enjoying it, aren't you, Harry? He nodded. I like him because his name is Harry. That's a good name, I said. Would you like me to borrow the book from Alice and read you a few chapters tonight? No, he replied quickly. I want to watch cartoons. 
Alice rubbed a hand through his hair. Don't forget you have homework to do first. I already forgot, Harry said. He laughed. He was making a joke. His blue eyes twinkled. Go get your backpack, Alice told him. It's in my bedroom. When Harry left the room, she pulled me aside and spoke in a confidential tone. He stayed up late last night. That's very bad for him. He's a beast when he doesn't get his sleep. Be sure to get him to bed early. No problem, I said. He seems very sweet. He is, Alice said, her eyes on the hallway watching for Harry to return. He's a good student, too. He learns quickly. He really likes to learn new things. That's awesome, I whispered back. Alice placed a hand on my shoulder. Eight-year-olds can be a challenge, though, even if they're as sweet as Harry. If you have any problems at all, just call me. She reached into the pocket of her sweatpants and handed me a slip of paper with her phone number on it. Thanks, I said. I don't think you'll have problems with him, but just in case. I started to thank her again, but I stopped when I heard a shrill cry. A tiny voice. Was it coming from the basement? Startled, I listened hard. It sounded like a sob. Mr. Puffball, be quiet, Alice shouted. She laughed and shook her head. My cat is very good at letting me know when he's hungry. Oh, wow, I said. It didn't sound like a cat. Alice laughed again. Mr. Puffball can communicate really well, especially at dinner time. I smiled, but the cry I heard didn't sound at all like a cat. It sounded human. Chapter 19 Can I sit on your lap? Harry had to be the sweetest, friendliest eight-year-old in the world. By the time he finished his mac and cheese dinner, he and I were already BFFs. He was funny and smart. He whipped through his homework, about six pages of math problems. His big joke of the night? He'd tug at my hair and make a different sound effect each time. For some reason, he thought that was a riot. But when I tugged his hair and made an oink oink sound, he said it wasn't funny at all. He kept begging me to stay up late. Maybe some other night, not tonight, I answered. That seemed to satisfy him. Until ten minutes later, when he'd ask me again. He sat on my lap and we watched Kung Fu Panda 2 on Netflix, the cartoon made him laugh. A couple of times, he leapt to the floor and did some crazy kung fu moves. When the movie ended, I glanced at the time. Nearly eight o'clock. Bedtime, I told him. I have a panda upstairs, he said, in my closet. Maybe I could bring him down. We could do our own panda movie. Not tonight, I insisted. A short one? No, not tonight. I see what you're doing, Harry. You're stalling. Come on, let's get you in your pajamas. After that, he was no problem. We got him changed and tucked in. I said goodnight. He asked me to close his door, so I did. Downstairs, I washed the dinner dishes. Then I sat down on the living room couch to read my English assignment. A short story by an author I'd never heard of. Willa Cather. I'm not too interested in farm life, so the story was pretty boring. I was glad when my phone rang and it was Nate. What's up? How's the kid? He asked. He's awesome, I said. Maybe the most adorable kid in the world. Sweet. What did you give him for dinner? Frosted flakes? I laughed. No way. I made him mac and cheese, right out of the box. It's his favorite. The kid is so easy. This job is a breeze. Nice, Nate said. I'm just checking in. You know, see how it's going. Hey, I have to ask you something, I said. 
I had this weird phone call from Summer Lawson. Huh? Summer? You're kidding. It was totally awkward and strange, Nate. I think she was calling to warn me about you. About me? He snickered. Yeah, I'm real dangerous. I'm a real dangerous dude. Well, why did she call me? I demanded. How should I know? He snapped. She's crazy. No, really. She's crazy, Lisa, he said. Ask anyone. And she's a total troublemaker. I heard a crackling in my ear. Hey, where are you? I asked. It doesn't sound like you're home. He hesitated. Um, uh, out. Where? Are you nearby? Kind of, he said. Why is he being so weird? Why won't he tell me where he is? Did you hear about Isaac? He said. He convinced his friends to come back to the band. Amazing, I said. How did he convince them? He said he'd divide up the money they make at the club Saturday night evenly. That's all it took? I guess, Nate said. They'll still suck, but at least Isaac won't be standing up there with that 12-year-old drummer. It's a shame about the band, I said. Isaac is a good guitar player. Isaac kissed me. Isaac kissed me and Nate saw. That moment played again in my mind. Maybe we should go see him Saturday night, I said. Maybe. Nate replied. Was he thinking about that kiss too? We talked a little longer. Then I returned to the short story. Not much happened in the story. It seemed to be mostly description of the wheat fields and the dry, flat plains around the farm. After a while, my eyelids began to feel heavy. I think maybe I drifted off to sleep for a little while. Then a noise jolted me awake. The book fell from my lap and bounced on the carpet. I heard the noise again. A tapping. From upstairs? Harry? I called. Is that you? I jumped to my feet and turned to the stairway. Harry! Are you still awake? It's late. No reply. Silence. I jumped as the floor up there creaked from footsteps. Harry, are you walking around up there? Answer me. Harry. My heart started to pound as I made my way to the stairway. I gazed into the dim light at the top and gasped in horror. Chapter 20 I saw a blur of light. Two legs, a shadowy figure, darting across the landing. Was it a man? An intruder? Hey, stop! I choked out a cry. My heart was thudding so hard, I thought my chest might explode. Stop! I see you! I should have called 911, but I didn't think. I saw the intruder flash across the landing, heading toward Harry's room. I grabbed the banister and pulled myself up the steep stairs. Stop! Who are you? What are you doing here? I screamed all the way up. My legs trembling, my chest aching. I reached the landing. I gazed down the long hall, Harry's door was wide open. No! Stop! Get out of there! I screamed in a hoarse voice I'd never heard before. My shoes caught on the ragged carpet as I lowered my head and ran down the hall. I stumbled and nearly fell to my knees, regained my balance and kept running. Harry! I shouted. Are you okay? No answer. I burst into his room, gasping for breath. The room was dark. The only light came from the open window. And in that gray light, I saw the intruder. His back to me as he thundered to the window, lowered his head, 
and leaped out. Leaped out a second story window. He didn't make a sound. I bolted to the window and stuck my head out. The air felt cool against my burning hot face. I peered down into the yard, squinting in the pale light, and I saw a twisted shadow scrabbling across the grass. The man bent over, legs bent like insect legs, moving to the deep shadow at the back of the yard. I gripped the windowsill tightly and watched as he ran. And just before he reached the black blanket of shadow, he turned. He turned and his face caught the moonlight. And I screamed again, because his face wasn't human. It was the ugly, twisted face of a demon creature from a horror movie. Green skin. A light bulb shaped bald scalp with a thick stripe of black fur down the middle, and sharp pig ears poking up from the sides. Blood red eyes glaring like headlights over a long wolfish snout. No! A low moan escaped my throat. I knew I was hallucinating again. The same creature I saw when I was sleepwalking in the woods. I was seeing it again. I was seeing something that wasn't there, hallucinating a demon again. Insane, insane. No, oh, please, no. I turned to the bed. Harry, are you okay? Harry! He wasn't there. Chapter 21 I froze, staring at the empty bed, the covers tossed to the floor. I clicked on the ceiling light. I stood there unable to move, unable to think straight. Total panic. And a million thoughts raced through my mind at once. The intruder was real, not an hallucination. He was wearing a mask, like the monster mask Nate wore for Sarah Lynn's video, like the dozens of monster masks in Nate's collection. He was real. He wore a mask. He was in this room. I didn't make him up. I saw him. Did he grab Harry? Pull Harry from his bed and leap out the window with him? How was that possible? Get a grip, Lisa. Get control. Get control. I struggled to slow down my furious breathing. I turned away from the empty bed. Think. Got to think clearly. Harry? Harry! I shouted his name. Maybe he was still in the house. Maybe he could hear me. Harry! Are you here? Please be here. But no reply. I stumbled out into the hall and gazed up and down. Harry! Are you here? Please answer me, Harry! No, no. The panic had me in its grip. I knew I had to try to clear my head and act rationally. But the hallway was tilting and spinning. I could barely breathe. Harry! 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 I knew what I had to do. I had to call the police. My phone. Where was my phone? Downstairs, on the living room couch. I hurled myself down the stairs. I ran into the living room, grabbed my bag off the couch, frantically pawed through it for the phone. Oh, where is it? Where? I heard a knocking sound, very nearby. The bag fell from my hand. I heard scraping. Another knock. A soft thud. Someone is in the house. I could feel the panic tighten its grip on me. I couldn't think. I couldn't breathe. Someone was at the front of the house. The masked intruder had returned. Chapter 22 Another soft thud. I stood frozen by the couch, 
my bag at my feet and listened. It sounded like knocking. Someone knocking on the front door? Without thinking, I lurched to the entryway. No one there. No one in the house. The knocking sounds again. I turned. The coat closet. The sounds were coming from the coat closet. Who's there? I tried to shout, but the words came out in a choked whisper. Who? I stepped to the closet, yanked open the door and gasped. Harry, what are you doing in here? I cried. He stood huddled against the back wall, surrounded by coats. His whole body was trembling, and his face was as pale as flour. I'm scared, he said in a tiny voice. I reached for him with both hands, and he let me pull him from the closet. The poor little kid was shaking so hard. I lifted him up and held him close until the shivers seemed to end. S someone came into my room, he stammered. Someone scared me, so I ran to the closet. It's okay, I said, smoothing back his blonde hair. His pale forehead was drenched with sweat. It's okay now. I led him to the couch. He wanted to sit on my lap. I tugged him up and wrapped my arms around him. Did you see the man? I asked. Did you see his face? Harry shook his head. It was too dark. I didn't really see him. I heard someone in my room. So I ran downstairs and I hid in the closet. I suddenly had an idea, a way to calm Harry. Maybe it was a nightmare, I said. Maybe it was just a bad dream you were having. I was lying, of course, but if it would calm him down and make him feel safe. He looked up at me with those big blue eyes. Really? You think I was dreaming? I nodded. Yes, we all have nightmares. I have nightmares a lot. But then I wake up and everything is fine. He stared at me, thinking about it. Maybe, he said finally. It felt kind of like a nightmare. He nestled his head against my shoulder and we sat there in silence for a while. I pictured the intruder again, with the ugly strip of fur down his misshapen head. Once again, I pictured him leaping from Harry's bedroom window and scrambling across the backyard. I saw his face in the moonlight as he turned and stared up at me. The wolfish snout. The twisted, hideous face. Was it a mask? Like that horror movie mask Nate wore? No. No way. Why would someone put on a mask, break into the house, run upstairs, and leap out a window? It was totally crazy. It made no sense at all. I was glad I lied to Harry. I was glad that maybe I convinced him the whole thing was a bad dream. It felt like a bad dream to me, too but I knew better. After a few minutes, I realized that Harry had fallen asleep on my lap. He was snoring gently, his head still pressed against me. My legs started to ache. He began to feel heavy, but I didn't want to move him. I sat there holding on to him, and maybe I dozed off too, because the next thing I knew, I felt a gentle tap on my shoulder. I blinked, turned my head, and saw Brenda gazing down on me. Oh, hi, I managed, trying to wake up. She had dark rings around her eyes. Her lipstick had faded. Her hair was tousled. She smiled at me. I guess you and Harry have bonded already, she said. He had a nightmare, I said. He came downstairs so I could comfort him. That's wonderful, Lisa. 
she set down her briefcase. Harry is usually shy with new people. No, we had a good time, I said. I think we're going to be pals. Brenda helped lift him off my lap. Harry woke up groggily and eyed his mother without speaking. I climbed off the couch and helped Brenda get him to his feet. Then we half carried him, half walked him up the stairs to his room. After we deposited him in his bed, we returned to the living room. I picked my bag up off the floor. Brenda yawned. She brushed her hair back. I'm exhausted, she said, sighing. Long hours. She turned to me. So, everything went fine? My mind spun. No, it didn't go fine. There was an intruder in the house with the face of a demon. He ran into Harry's room and leaped out of the second story window. Everything wasn't fine. In fact, it was terrifying for me and for Harry. But if I tell Brenda the truth, if I tell her about the demon creature in the house, she probably won't believe me. She'll think I'm crazy and I'll lose this job. I need this job. I really need it. Yes, I said. No problems. Everything went fine. Harry is a total 